Tony, did you turn your um, video off? Okay. Tony, did you turn your video off or do I have it set that way? Uh, it, it, it suddenly went, actually, I'm not sure it might, I've returned my video on properly. Okay, wait, let's see. I just asked Here, okay. to turn this video on. Good. There. There you go. Okay. I hate this. I have to get too close to the picture. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi uh, am I the first one? You are. I think we're early, actually. Yeah, well, I usually open the room a little early in case people show up. Okay, why don't you just ignore me and go ahead and continue doing your emails for a while. Just okay, I can do that. I suspect. Consider yourself ignored. Okay. Um, so, Fred, welcome and thank you for your time and for uh, being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Lynn. It's a pleasure. And I might say that introduction was one that uh, my wife enjoyed and my mother might believe. Sounds like something you know, stupid. A couple of caveats before I start. Um, for everyone. One is I'm I'm really not an expert. So, um, but being an academician, as many of you on this call probably are or were, uh, you know, we'll talk about anything if given the chance. So uh, I appreciate Emily and Carol inviting me to do this. Uh, I did um, let them know that I'd need a lot of help from them particularly Carol, because when we get to the bottom line of all of this, uh, I'm going to turn to Carol and ask for her, um, her insight as to where CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, are going to end up, uh, because that's going to determine whether we keep this uh, advantageous methodology 
as an option for everyone as best we can, or whether it goes back into its hiding place where it's been for about 30 years when telehealth really first got started at least 30 years ago. Uh, and it's grown really uh, logarithmically since the COVID epidemic, obviously. Um, and that's what's pushing all of us. So I'm coming at this from a very specific vantage point. As Lynn indicated, I'm what's called a super subspecialist, which in popular jargon means I know more and more about less and less. Uh, and this is, again, clearly not an area of my expertise, but I've been forced into um, converting my entire practice virtually at this point into telehealth um, from the vantage point of someone who's both anxious to make sure I stay in touch with my patients and uh, as someone who's in a high-risk group so that my ability to deliver face-to-face -face care um, is quite limited right now. Uh, if I were doing that right now, you wouldn't be able to see me. I'd be in full protective gear in a, a 95 mask, covered by another mask, covered by a plastic shield, and wearing full protective gowns and two pair of gloves. Uh, I don't call that humanistic medicine, which I like to believe I try and practice, but it's what we have to do right now. It's reality, and I think we have to temper all our expectations with the primary need to protect each other and do our best to uh, avoid either infecting someone else or becoming infected ourselves. So with all of those caveats, um, let me say, um, as most of us try to do when we teach, which is to tell you what I'm going to tell you, tell you, and then tell you what I told you. Um, and at the end, I'm going to take out my crystal ball, which is about as clear as the rest of yours, and, uh, um, and talk about what I think the future might look like. I've provided, and Lynn was kind enough to send out, I think, to everyone, a few um, useful references. Um, uh, particularly, uh, I always turn to, to my old friend Jane Brody's column in the New York Times, and I thought she did a very nice job uh, about a, uh, a month ago in summarizing her experiences and uh, what she believed is out there. And I think um, Paula Spann in the same, on the same page of the New York Times on the same day in her new old age column also provided, uh, I thought, a very useful perspective, as did Fran Kritz in the Washington Post uh, just um, uh, almost a month ago. And then just in this week's New England Journal of Medicine was a very uh, interesting um, and effective uh, review called COVID-19 and Healthcare's Digital Revolution. And for those of you not familiar perhaps with the three authors, all are really quite um, knowledgeable and important healthcare providers and economists who um, I think uh, describe the ins and outs of telehealth quite well. Um, and so we have that as a background. So first I'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons as I see them and try to help all of us manage expectations. Um, then I'll, I'll try to briefly discuss how to make the most out of the telehealth experience should you uh, feel that it's in your best interest to utilize it. And then finally, as I said at the end, we'll summarize and look to the future. Although, as I say, I really need these crystal ball better than I know mine is because all of this will depend on the financing. Ultimately, 
it's going to be a question of whether you love it or hate it based on your personal experiences, your ability to get reimbursed and your doctor's ability to get reimbursed is going to drive this. Whether we like that or not, um, it's an expensive proposition. Um, and uh, we've been forced into it. And um, I think that's a good thing. So let me talk a little bit about the pros and cons. And I'll briefly summarize uh, sort of six pros and about uh, four or five cons, um, which can be all addressed, I think, to bring us to some sort of realistic and reasonable compromise for how we view telehealth and how we either choose to utilize it or not. I don't think there's much doubt that for all of its history, and I say it's about 30 or 40 years, for rural areas of the United States and other countries, it's been a terrific boon to uh, provide access to people who just otherwise wouldn't have it because they're miles and miles and miles uh, from their nearest medical facility. And um, it, it really has been a tremendous boon. So why hasn't it grown? Well, um, it hasn't grown uh, largely because of um, an, an inability of physicians to embrace the concept, uh, A, and B, an unwillingness of CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, to lift a number of barriers to adopting uh, telehealth, which they did with split second uh, adroit adroitness when the epidemic hit, when the pandemic was officially on our doorstep and everywhere, um, um, CMS did a 180 degrees and uh, quickly made it more accessible. So its major pro is access, and that's true in the inner city, it's true in the suburbs, it's true everywhere. And um, it, um, it makes your accessibility to your doctor or your nurse practitioner or your physician's assistant or anyone who can offer you, including your, your physical therapist, um, an ability to do things at home in um, quiet um, surroundings and in more comfort and less anxiety provoking interaction than you would probably have for most visits. If you think white coat hypertension is a fiction, um, I can guarantee you that at least 50% of my patients suffer from white coat hypertension, which is why I didn't wear one today so that I could be sure that you could enjoy your, your drink at home uh, in comfort uh, without getting more anxious than usual. Um, one of the other pros is um, a decrease in access costs. And that includes um, convenience factors that we don't usually build into budgets uh, for healthcare, uh, including uh, the cost of getting to and from your doctor, uh, the childcare costs for many people that they have to um, utilize to, in order to attend appointments, uh, the distances traveled I mentioned is the original stimulus, uh, that if you lived in Australia and didn't have a bush pilot doctor, to visit you. Um, telehealth was an enormous benefit to people who lived very, very far from the nearest facility. But even if you live close, parking is a hassle, uh, public transportation is a hassle, and all of it costs uh, a fair amount of money. So um, decreasing access costs ultimately, I believe, will be an enormous uh, benefit to healthcare. 
um, particularly for those in the inner city, if we're able to substitute access to telehealth um, in, in a meaningful way. The third uh, issue I think is time. Uh, time is precious for everyone, but, um, but for patients to travel um, uh, and be able to get access to their physician more quickly without necessarily having to uh, resort to um, uh, special care or an annual fee, uh, um, I think this is an advantage for many, many people. They can call up and, and schedule a telehealth visit with their physician or the nurse practitioner or the uh, physician's assistant or anyone else in the healthcare axis that's participating. And generally, the turnaround is much faster than it would be for a face-to-face -face appointment. Not always, but often. Um, and then the, the, the ultimate pro is safety in this environment. I don't think there's any question that uh, the first thing patients say to me when I call them to ask them if it would be all right to reschedule their face-to-face -face visit um, with a telehealth visit is they usually say, thank you. I would love to stay away from your office. Uh, regardless of how nice the prints are on your wall, um, I don't feel very comfortable right now coming into a healthcare facility unless it's really important. Now the flip side of that is uh, one of the downsides that we'll come to in a minute, but there's a, been a tremendous jump in, in both morbidity and mortality rates from other chronic diseases uh, since COVID-19 from people not responding to symptoms and signs of serious problems and not going to the emergency rooms. So I, what I don't want to do with this talk is to tell you at any point in time that telehealth is the equivalent of seeing your physician face to face. It's just not. And uh, if you have a serious problem, telehealth is not your answer you need to go and be seen by a, a health professional. Um, one of the other interesting possible pros, and it's not true in all situations, but it gives your doctor uh, or your healthcare provider um, an opportunity to kind of evaluate your home environment. They can ask to see what your, what your bathroom looks like what the route looks like from your bed to your bathroom in the middle of the night, how well lit that is, uh, what are the obstacles in your environment that might provide risk for you at home. So I think that uh, that could be uh, proven and needs to be studied carefully in well-designed trials, uh, an advantage of telehealth that could increase your safety at home as opposed to uh, turning around and saying it increases your safety not to go in um, in the current COVID-19 environment. Um, and then there are other, other possible advantages and pros, um, and I alluded to that early on, is that patients are more relaxed and more comfortable in their home environment until I ask them to take off all their clothes, of course, but uh, until that happens, it's, um, it, it, it's often a much easier experience for patients uh, to do telehealth. And um, they're often grateful for that, uh, that lack of anxiety. It's especially important for elderly patients who may not be able to get out of the house with ease, um, and, um, and can use their computers effectively. And we try um, in our practice to uh, make sure ahead of time, patients are set up and can use their equipment easily and uh, have the right kind of camera and audio uh, capabilities. And if not, um, we try to make arrangements to make that happen for them 
if they want the assistance to do that. Uh, and I think most physicians are trying very hard to accommodate patients by helping them develop uh, this capability. So that's what I've got to say about the pros of telehealth. There may be many more that experts can allude to, and I'm sure many of you will have um, other things you've thought about that uh, for you either are pros or cons. Now, the first and most important con I've already mentioned, which is that this is not a substitute for seeing uh, your doctor and being examined. Uh, if you have a, a cardiac problem and you have a rhythm disturbance or you have symptoms or signs of cardiac disease or virtually any other chronic illness that requires a good physical exam, please don't think uh, it's easy to substitute telehealth. There are ways to augment it, uh, those visits, so that um, all of our patients who have pacemakers, we can now uh, follow what's going on remotely um, uh, on a regular, on a real-time basis uh, with patients who have, uh, who have uh, uh, pacemakers, who have ventricular fibrillation, defibrillator devices. We can set them, we can adjust them. Uh, so there are lots of things you can do remotely. But if uh, you discover a lump somewhere under your arm or a breast lump or in your groin or somewhere else that you want checked out, you can't do that on, with telehealth very easily. And uh, so it's not a substitute. If you've developed a motion problem, uh, a neurologic problem, a rash that it's hard to show your doctor on your monitor, um, if you need a good eye exam, you can't do those things yet by telehealth. Uh, we are now, uh, speaking of the University of Rochester, all our medical students on day one now get a, um, a special, um, and I won't name the brand, but telephone that they can use um, to um, both on themselves and on their patients to listen to the heart, to measure the size of your liver or your spleen or their own for that matter, uh, that they can turn and do an eye exam on themselves uh, or on a patient on a telescreen. And the, that's going to get better and better. The optics for those uh, devices are going to get better and better. Um, the audio uh, aspects are going to get better and better. And so you will be able to do a lot of a physical exam remotely uh, with patients in the future. But right now, there is no substitute for a a good physical exam, and an opportunity to talk to your doctor one-on-one uh, -on -one in person can't really be duplicated so well on the screen. Excuse me. Um, the good news about one of the major cons up until now, as I also alluded to, was that the expense uh, was not covered previously by most insurance plans, and Medicare and Medicaid had terrific obstacles and limitations. Um, the, um, those have virtually all been lifted, and the regulations surrounding uh, management of uh, telemedicine have been reassessed on a temporary basis. And so, as I said, I think the bottom line for all of this is going to be what happens when the pandemic is gone? What is CMS going to do about reimbursement? Right now, they reimburse exactly what they'd reimburse for a one-on-one face-to-face -on -face visit. They'll even do that for a telephone visit now, which up until two weeks ago wasn't true. Um, not all insurance companies have followed suit, so you have to check with your provider and make sure that um, your 
the healthcare provider is going to get reimbursed, uh, and you're not stuck with a bill for um, uh, a visit that you didn't expect. Uh, the promise of Congress uh, to address unexpected bills from emergency room visits, for example, is still in limbo. Uh, unfortunately, I thought that bill was going to sail through because that was clearly one of the president's first promises to get done was to eliminate those unexpected emergency room visit bills where uh, a provider who's not in your plan provides you a service and, and, and suddenly you get a bill that uh, your insurance doesn't cover. Um, and that was true for a lot of telemedicine uh, until the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So CMS has lifted the regs, has temporarily um, reduced the oversight for HIPAA, which is, as most of you know, health insurance um, um, uh, per, uh, portability and uh, protection, very concerned about protecting your, the security of your uh, secure health information, which is um, another con potentially of telehealth. Early on, uh, Zoom was fraught with fraud, if you will, with hacking and with lots of people entering your Zoom conference calls, one this large, for example, uh, would have been quite uh, susceptible to hacking. One-on-one -on -one Zoom, at least for about 99% of healthcare providers, is pretty secure and not very susceptible to hacking because there are about three or four layers of access that have to be gone through before healthcare Zoom calls are allowed. And that's true for most of the other platforms as well, which I have less experience with, but lots of my colleagues use. And my son who works for the Department of Homeland Security, uh, as you might expect, is able to uh, use uh, with even greater security uh, protections. So I don't think that's much of a problem anymore, but <clears throat> You're always able to ask your provider what the security provisions are before you agree to doing either telehealth or phone calls for health providers. <clears throat> the um, fourth and last con that I'll mention is uh, the obvious, which is equipment hardware and software. <clears throat> it may be difficult for some to download the apps that are necessary and to update their computers with adequate uh, cameras and a sound system that provides a seamless and uh, really easy um, interaction with your physician. I strongly recommend grandchildren when it comes to how you adapt. I wish I had some so they would have helped me a lot more. It took me a couple of weeks before I could get even modestly adept at doing uh, these calls with my patients. And I blame it all on my children because they didn't provide me with grandchildren who are probably the most adept at doing these calls. Uh, but those of you who are already uh, very proficient with your grandchildren, I'm sure, need no help whatsoever. And if you do, you can bribe them easily by uh, getting them to come on over. Um, Zoom may not be optimal for everyone. And there are other uh, platforms that I'm sure you're familiar with, including FaceTime and Skype and things you can do from your phone that I probably don't even uh, begin to understand. Um, but um, much of that's going to just change for the better overnight. I mean, as there's more and more demand and, and platforms like Zoom make more and more money, 
from their advertising and other sources of income, um, I think you'll find that, uh, that it's pretty easy to do this. And even those who aren't on the call today can, can probably um, um, uh, make use of these things in, in uh, real time very soon. So with that, I'll go move on to how to make the most of your telehealth visits. Um, first and foremost, just as I tell all my patients, whenever they can to make a list of their medications and keep it up to date and stick it in, uh, either get it on a little plastic card or put it into a plastic envelope and put it in your briefcase or your purse, uh, put a copy in the, in the, on the dash, the, uh, um, in your car, in the uh, dash box, uh, uh, keep it with you at all times. Do that also um, um, for uh, a list of questions that you have of your doctor before you go. Because I don't know about you, but when I go to my doctor, I become immediately brain dead. I can't remember half the things that I wanted to ask about and talk about. It just, so I'm like everybody, uh, at least most patients, and that's that um, I develop a level of anxiety in a doctor's office that I didn't, there's no reason I should have, but I do. Um, and it's best if you have a list with you uh, the, of questions that you want answers to. And uh, it's always nice to bring a significant other or a friend or someone who can help you to interpret what you heard. Because as one of my professors used to say, 50% of what we tell students is wrong and we don't know which half it is. Uh, and we're gonna change it next week anyways you forget about 50% of what you've been told by the doctor during that fairly compressed period of time. And no matter how hard they try, and we might try to make you comfortable and spend as much time as possible with you, we, we are funded to spend 15 minutes with you maximum. And I, I'm, I have a luxurious practice since I'm a, uh, a retired or semi-retired professor uh, and I can spend as much time as I want, but that's pretty hard for most doctors. And so it's good to be prepared for telehealth visits just as it is for your in-person visits to get the most out of it you can. Uh, just with your visits to your doctor face-to-face, I encourage you to wear loose clothing. So if you've got a rash on your arm or you've got something you wanna show your doctor, it's pretty easy to do that on your monitor. Um, make sure your device is um, adequate to move around in case your doctor wants to see the route from your bedroom to your bathroom, wants to see where the obstacles might be. Um, make sure that works okay. So plug in your devices uh, the night before your visit, your telehealth visit. Make sure they're fully charged and, um, and practice using your camera on the monitor to demonstrate uh, both areas of concern on you uh, so that you can stay televised well and areas around your home you want to illustrate. Um, be prepared to, to demonstrate any obstacles that are uh, obstacles to your safety, your personal safety at home. Um, and find a quiet, private place, if that's possible, um, uh, in your home. Um, and, uh, and I think that's probably the list as I see it. So last but not least, and where I think there'll be the most questions, are what does the future look like? Um, and I've already alluded to some of the um, uh, barriers to access for many patients um, 
for traditional visits, we do a lousy job of uh, making it easy for patients to come see us, particularly for those in the inner city often. Public transportation is often very difficult. Um, we are lucky at GW, we're right at a subway stop. Um, so that makes life easier for a lot of patients, but it's still uh, a barrier. And um, the restriction of access is probably the most important uh, problem in delivering good quality health care today. Um, and, uh, and so I think telehealth's important. I've come around to believing that because it does increase access, that it outweighs a lot of its uh, negative properties. Uh, as I've said, CMS restrictions and arduous regulations about how you maintain um, HIPAA requirements, and I'll give you just a, one example. When HIPAA was first implemented, uh, right out of Ted Kennedy's uh, staff office um, and was passed, um, the unforeseen and uh, unpredicted consequences of the cost of implementation of HIPAA cost my budget at the time I was vice president for research for George Washington University. And it cost me $2 million out of my budget the first year to implement HIPAA. The maintenance of HIPAA costs much more than that. All the training, all the, the skills that are needed to protect your uh, important health uh, security is a very expensive proposition. And, uh, and for the future, that needs to be taken into content uh, with telehealth. So CMS has got to think that through very carefully. And um, if uh, Carol Kelly's on the call, I would love her to comment what she thinks they might do when the pandemic is gone and they have to rethink how they're going to both reimburse and how they're going to implement and continue to implement regulations. Um, in the past, as I've said, rural health is the model for that. Um, but I think now uh, it's gonna be a very important uh, adjunct to healthcare. Um, the future is now. The GAO report in 2017 said that there are only 1% of people on Medicare utilizing telehealth. NORC, which as most of you know is the National Opinion Research Center, the University of Chicago, in April of 2020 uh, said there are now more than 20% of people over the age of 70 um, utilizing telehealth, um, and half of them, when when polled, were extremely satisfied and said that they felt it was equivalent to the quality of of face to face visits. Um, but I think ultimately, uh, the, there's less positive, obviously, uh, experiences for anyone with any degree of dementia or any cognitive issues of any kind, uh, convenience factors and cost reimbursement will clearly determine the uptake. Um, you know, in Washington, uh, we say it's either about sex or money, uh, but it's usually about both. Uh, in telehealth, it's certainly about money. Uh, we need data on the effectiveness of telehealth and I think uh, the paper that we that uh, Lynn was good enough to send all of you by Kisa, Jonas, and Shulman in the perspective of the New England Journal provides, I think, the first step in how to achieve the kind of data we need uh, to determine if this is really a, a, a cost-effective approach to health care. Uh, and we have to be concerned about fraud. Uh, Medicare fraud and Medicaid fraud are huge drains on our healthcare budget. Um, all of our institutions employ 
an enormous number of people who are strictly there to make sure we document everything appropriately to avoid um, any Medicare or Medicaid interventions that even smells of wrongdoing. But uh, with telehealth, it's going to be another layer of, of issues about fraud uh, and misrepresentation of what you're actually doing for patients. So uh, I think that's going to have to be studied carefully. And, um, and the concerns about a lot of other devices, texting, emailing, mobile phone apps, wearable devices and how we monitor them. More and more of my patients are uh, wearing glucose monitors. More and more of my patients have the ability, as I suggested earlier, to uh, send me information by all of these devices. But how am I guaranteeing them their security? Have I put into place adequately? And have we as a profession taken sufficient care to make sure that your personal health information is protected. So those are the, my big questions. And uh, I'll know. Uh, I think Carol is ready to answer you. I did, uh, she is unmuted. And before she does, I just wanted to mention for those of you on the call who are members of the village, we have copies of the file of life that we are happy to distribute for you to fill out with your medication and everything, you know, Fred mentioned that you keep it on your refrigerator or you keep it in your dashboard. If you need an extra copy, please let us know. We do have them all ready to send out to you or to give out to you. Uh, Carol, are you ready to answer Fred's questions? Uh, yes, I am. And let me start by saying, uh, Fred, that is exactly uh, the presentation that Emily and I were envisioning uh, from the perspective of a practitioner who's actually working with patients to explain kind of where telehealth fits in healthcare delivery and how you can avail yourself of those services and what they can be useful for and what they are less useful for. So thank you. That was just uh, right on target, at least from my perspective. Uh, I've been involved in health policy since the early 1980s, worked in the insurance industry for 10 years, worked at CMS, worked at HHS for eight years. Um, Kind of worked my way around the industry, hospitals, and the last nine years I taught with the pharmacy community. Um, to answer your question most directly, Fred, yes, I think that there will be a bigger role for telehealth in the future than there historically has been in the Medicare program. But the reason I preface it with giving a little background on myself is one constant, and I think you know this, um, over the decades I've been watching and involved with healthcare delivery is the concept of induced demand through reimbursement policy. And what insurers and CMS are not looking to do is to induce payment for additional services that are maybe, may or may not be necessary. But when this whole crisis came about, um, you know, generally I look at what happens in healthcare as a revolution at an evolutionary pace this is really breathtaking to see what the agency did here, as you said, with busting down through emergency authorities, um, the ability to move beyond just doing um, visits that they were clear about were not going to be substituting for something else so that they would pay for telehealth and also pay for another visit. Um, and that was the purpose in rural areas and it linked to providers that you already know and those sorts of things so that they could keep more of a handle around what it was that the uh, healthcare delivery system was doing and what should be reimbursed. But I can tell you just today, because I, I, I maintain um, a consulting, a small consulting business of my own and keep up to date on things. I saw today Seema Verma, who's the CMS administrator, give a quote basically saying, um, what happened here with telehealth has been remarkable and it's positive for Medicare beneficiaries and we want to keep it going. So I don't know exactly what that means for the specifics of reimbursement policy and knowing kind of CMS, my guess is they'll take the data that they've collected during this time period, figure out what's gone on and figure out 
uh, where it's promoted, the kind of access they want, where, as you say, it's, um, you know, it's not uh, led to fraud, provided for adequate privacy and security, as you said, two different issues, and figure out how to um, kick down the barriers on telehealth. If it will be as broad as what we're seeing now, my guess is they will have internal debates on the expense and value of that. But I can also tell you that I, I did do a fundraiser yesterday with a member of the Senate Finance Committee, and he was talking about telehealth, and he said he'd been over to the White House, and the chief of staff, Mark Meadows at the White House, was interested in more promoting telehealth because he comes from part of the country that's more rural. So this whole experiment as experience, I guess is the best way I'd put it, has really, I think, uh, put telehealth in the and the center of delivery right now. And I think it's really going to break down some of the barriers, but I can't tell you exactly what it's going to look like once people debate it more and CMS analyze the data. But yes, I do think we'll see more telehealth. So thank you very much. I have, if I could take the privilege of the first question, since I got to answer one of yours, um, you talked very clearly about the ways in which uh, telehealth helps patients and other ways that you should actually really go see your physician. If I were considering a telehealth visit with my practice, for example, and contacted the practice, how is it that the practices call, uh, you know, kind of call out, okay, we're going to have you do a telehealth but you really need to come into the office to be seen. Do they have protocols or practices for that? Or is the telehealth visit scheduled? And then if that's not enough, then, you know, the patient's advised to go to an in-person visit. Very good question, Carol, as I'd expect. Um, and, and I think it's going to vary as much as it varies with other technology. Uh, most of the practices that I'm familiar with are at GW and depending on the specialty and what they need to know about you, if it's your first visit, um, they'll often use a telehealth now as a screen and determine the nature of your concerns. And then from there, make a value judgment as to how urgently, if at all, you need to come in uh, to have a full full visit. So right. that's how many practices are. Now, uh, clearly for the bulk of my group practice that I'm in, which is hematology oncology, most of those patients have cancer. Most of them have already had the cancer diagnosed. They've sent ahead the slides of their tumor that have been evaluated by a pathologist, the x-rays needed um, that determine the staging of their disease, and a lot of other very technical information ahead of time. So that it's pretty necessary um, most times for that patient to be seen for obvious reasons. And particularly if it's in anticipation of beginning chemotherapy. Um, we would absolutely need to see those patients, make sure all of the information we have is up to date and absolutely correct um, before embarking on a course of um, potentially toxic therapy. But for my practice, most of the patients that I see, I'm their third or fourth hematologist often, um, I know a great deal about them from all the information they've provided. And often I, it's based on my assessment of what they've been told before. And then I can do most of that on telehealth, um, having seen their laboratory evaluation and then determine what else needs to be done. So the protocol before the visit, um, um, Carol is really critical, but varies from specialty to specialty, depending on what the physician depends on most to be able to really help you. Thank you. Thank you. A dermatologist is not going to let you get away with uh, stripping at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, there may be others that have questions, so thank you for answering mine. 
Thank you, Fred. Actually, Risha has a question and I've unmuted her. So Risha, go for it. Yes, actually it's partially answered by what you just said, but I also see the value of hybrid visits. That is that um, most of the time when I go to see a doctor, first, of course, there's time in the waiting room, unless you're the first visit of the day. And I think what I'm about to propose would help with that, which is the next thing I do is I see an assistant and I answer a lot of questions and give a lot of information. And of course, how much time that takes can be anywhere from two minutes to 20 minutes, depending upon what's changed since my last visit with the doctor, or if it's a first visit. And I think the idea of hybrid visits, even when you know you're going to have to come in, but if all of that could be taken care of either the day before or the morning before an afternoon visit, it would save time because you could be, you know, you could have your computer on or you're available while yeah, you're doing right. something else. And it also would be more efficient because, okay, whether the uh, analysis that the system's taking down is going to take five minutes or 20 doesn't matter as much. We can work around that and be more flexible. Certainly. I, I absolutely agree with you. And it, it's slowly happening in a number of practices. My gastroenterologist, I'm meant to go online before my visit, update my, medic, my medication list, and, and answer all those questions that you're talking about ahead of time. So when I go in to see him, he's got all that data right in front of him. Uh, if there's any questions or concerns, I get a call back before my appointment to clarify anything that I've said that doesn't make sense to them. So I, I agree with you. That's the way we should all be doing business, but I'm afraid uh, it's going to take some time before that's we have sufficient um, man person power and capability to, to do that in a way that's helpful to you. And but especially, you're going to see more and more of it. Well, I was going to say, especially for those of us who are acquiring more and more physicians and where they have patient portals, but each one is different and each one, you know, you need a password for and you have to keep track of them all or have them all the same. Which the I said, yeah, well, Thank someplace you. else, but okay, Mac. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's why I talked about my gastroenterologist. That's where the pain really is. <laughs> okay, I think, uh, Jim, did you have a question? Yes, Fred, this is Jim Smith. I, Hi, Jim. It's, uh, it's rare for me to not have a on-site uh, visit with my physician without also giving some sort of sample, whether it be a blood sample or a urine sample or whatever. Is anything being done to facilitate the giving of those body samples um, more easily rather than going to the doctor's office so that telemedicine makes more sense for what otherwise might be a good use of telemedicine? An excellent question. And the answer is uh, yes. Um, most of our patients who are less mobile and really have a difficult time visiting our laboratory ahead of time which we try to do for everybody um, because we need blood counts on everyone we see. Um, most of that uh, now can be done in your home with a home visit by a, a phlebotomist, trained phlebotomist, who can come and draw your blood. We can even provide uh, um, portable uh, telemetrics of various sorts. We can take chest x-rays at home. We can do ultrasound exams at home. Um, there are a lot of things that can be done now which amplify the telehealth experience. But again, um, uptake is slow. We're, uh, no offense, Jim, but we're almost as slow as lawyers in changing what we do. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, Fred. He's an accountant. Or engineers, for that matter, like my son and you. Um, you know, it, we're slow on the uptake. Uh, we, we just 
don't quite get our act together very quickly and we kind of like to do things like we've always done them, that's a pretty big impediment. But um, like most things, if, if it looks like it's going to make life easier for us and our patients, and certainly if it saves money, which I think it, if it's done well, can, can certainly do, um, it's going to become much more, uh, uh, and, and it's also that our children and our grandchildren are going to be so much more adept at the mechanics and the software manipulation that um, they will be much less resistant to those kinds of improvements. So you're absolutely correct. Uh, right now, that's really, uh, it's nice to say your house is a renovated mid-century modern, but mid-century modern medicine ain't so good. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Fred before we finish this presentation? Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, wait, looks like Tony has a question. Tony, you want to unmute yourself? <clears throat> oh, I don't know who would be doing it, but who would make more effort to include the population that, uh, the poor, the, frankly, the lower income population uh, that may not have access to, um, perhaps they have a cell phone, a good cell phone, but they may not, may not have a computer. Um, to make sure that they could take advantage of this? It's a very good question because I think I alluded to that being a, an obstacle yeah. uh, for many, many households. Um, finding a quiet place just to have the conference may be an obstacle in many households. Um, um, but the answer to your question is a number of of uh, foundations and, and corporate entities are making uh, very large gifts. We, uh, I think, received a thousand um, um, Apple devices in our cancer center that we are providing to patients who do not have them at home uh, for telehealth visits. Mm -hmm. um, Similarly, I think other subspecialties are looking for funding to do just that so that they can hand out and train people in their homes, which we are now doing. We're sending out uh, nurse practitioners and PAs to people's homes to get them set up and, uh, and able to do telehealth at home using grant funds for supporting that, uh, that approach. And more and more cancer centers, that's now becoming a common uh, approach uh, of providing both software and hardware to patients who don't have access otherwise. Um, and you can't exactly go to your public library and take off your clothes, can you? So it's not the best place to have a health visit. Uh, so we're trying way, to get devices into the homes. Is there any way this can be combined with 911 calls? Hmm. I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not the best person to answer that. Uh, not being an emergency room physician or, um, or uh, uh, anyone who really knows what the mobile services are like. I really couldn't say, but I wouldn't be surprised if many of the devices we're now equipping patients with uh, are automatically or readily reprogrammable so that they can be combined with 911 type services. I, I just don't know the accurately the answer to your question, so I don't oh, want to mislead you. I, I know the right person to ask. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I think Gail also had a question. Gail? Yes, uh, Tony's question reminded me that it sounds a little bit red like the medical house call programs um, are getting more integrated with, with using telemedicine instead of the entire team having to go to the house for every visit. 
they may help patients, um, as you said, with the nurse practitioners, perhaps taking the blood draws and doing, because they have all the testing right in their little doctor's bag. Um, and it, it, I don't, I'm questioning whether there has been any in, integration uh, between those who do telemedicine and those who do house call medicine for geriatric patients, especially, and low-income geriatric patients, because the, the house call program I worked with was aimed specifically for the sickest of the sick, poorest of the poor in the Washington area, so it would address the Tony's issue. Thanks, uh, Gail. That's, that's also an excellent question, and the answer from my very limited perspective is yes. Um, I, I do telemedicine visits with patients in nursing homes regularly. Um, it's not always easy, um, but um, many of the nursing homes that we work with, particularly in our geriatric program, are very well equipped uh, to help their, their, their uh, uh, their patients uh, participate in telehealth visits. Some are, some aren't, and it, it varies dramatically across the spectrum of, of uh, chronic care facilities, as you might expect. Um, but I think this epidemic, this pandemic, which disproportionately affected uh, older individuals, A, B, minority individuals, and C, congregate facilities like nursing homes where the staff come and go and there's just a rampant spreading of a virus like this with no ability to, to monitor, um, as we've seen in many nursing facilities around the country, uh, nursing home facilities around the country, uh, it makes it very difficult. But that, I think, is a wake-up call to the industry, the chronic care industry, and I think uh, uh, you're going to see a lot better public health practices right along with telehealth to maximize the ability uh, to get patients looked at, talked to, evaluated, and then decided on with um, with subsequent testing, what needs to be done. Thank you. The program we dealt with was keeping people in their own homes so they could avoid nursing homes, which made it an added complication of, of getting to each patient. And that's why the telehealth component would, if those were combined, it seems to me there'd be some enormous efficiencies. Oh, I agree completely. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Let me just, uh, anybody wave your hand if you have a question. If not, thank you very much, Fred. I think this was very valuable. I really appreciate it. I know our members learned a lot and we're very fortunate to be able to have you answer our questions and give us such a thorough look at what's going on in telemedicine and where it might go in the future. I heard you, you don't have a crystal ball and I won't, I won't hold you to it but I definitely appreciated um, your information. I hope those of you who are on will join us on June 24th when Joe Sternlein will be talking about um, what's happening with the bid. I think there's been a few changes and I look forward to hearing what he has to say. And Fred, we invite you and Kay to join us for that as well. So thank Go you. Go Yellow Jackets. What's thank that? you very much. Go Yellow Jackets. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a nice evening. We'll send my money. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Liz. My pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.